Okay, everyone. Um, uh, as Ido has said, I'm Gemma, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ercilia. I'm currently dialing in from Barcelona, Spain, so it's the end of my day. And it's my pleasure today to introduce this talk about our hub for open source AI models uh, for antimicrobial drug discovery and global health. So what is Ercilia? Ercilia is a tech nonprofit. We focus in reducing inequalities in global health by providing laboratories mostly in the global south with AI tools um, to support infectious disease research. Why do we work in this space as a nonprofit? Um, well, I am sure you're, most of you are familiar with these numbers. Um, this is the world with each land plotted accordingly to its land area and the countries painted by their income. If we plot instead of the land area, the communicable disease burden, we see how those countries in the global south are much more affected by communicable diseases, unfortunately. And on the contrary, when we plot the scientific production, production we see how those countries are the ones that contribute less um, to science worldwide, with the global north countries, mainly Europe and the US, being most of the producers of global health, of um, scientific production, which leads to a clear imbalance in global health, to just to put some numbers into it. Six of the top 10 causes of death in low-income countries are still due to infectious diseases, but because those countries produce less than 5% of total world research, there is a huge gap in covering the needs, the health needs of the population in these areas because diseases are mostly researched in the global north and therefore um, investment is made on, on global north diseases. Um, to the number that currently less than 15% of the drugs that are being developed are targeting infections. And this means that the majority of the global South population does not have uh, adequate treatments um, for their health conditions. So what can we do in this um, huge uh, landscape of lack of uh, treatments for infectious diseases? Well, we use artificial intelligence because it's cost effective. It's faster to implement than experimental um, settings, of course. It's data driven, meaning that we can reuse the data that has been um, developed in other contexts. And we can also reuse methods uh, developed um, in other contexts, such as uh, cancer or Alzheimer's uh, disease for which there is more funding, resources, and, and data as well. So overall, um, and also this is a growing field, um, which is why um, as scientists, we are very excited to be able to push and bring state-of-the-art tools um, to researchers that usually don't have access to them. Our work is based on, th on three pillars as a nonprofit. The first is free and open source. Everything we do, we release openly um, with open access and open source licenses, and it's not patented. It can be used for both commercial and non-commercial purposes. We prioritize in country research, meaning that we try to support projects that are led by local institutions and we focus on implementing our tools there so that they can continue maintaining and developing them for their research purposes after the collaboration has finished and hopefully this leads us to our third pillar which is sustainable collaborations where we basically aim to deliver not only um, access to scientific tools but also capacity building and skills development workshops where we can train local scientists on the use of these new technologies so that they can continue working on them. And of course, everything we do, we try to adapt it to the context of um, resource constrained areas where maybe internet connection is not great or computational systems are not that powerful. That said, I put these slides um, when I give this kind of general introductory talks because I want everyone to understand who we are and with who we interact with. In the last three years, so RCD was founded at the end of 2020. So in the last three years, um, we have grown a network of collaborators, one with software engineers and big tech people that have helped us develop our tools, a bit more uh, further developing our tools more than just for academic purposes, but making them a bit more professional software. Um, we, of course, interact mostly with global south, uh, global south scientists. Most of our collaborations are currently in Africa. We, of course, interact with um, global north scientists, which provide us with tools and science um, and experimental capacity and so on. And also with um, larger organizations that act as data contributors and help us uh, develop new models with their data. To give an example, um, we work with centers like the University of Boyan, Cameroon, the HT Center in South Africa, Pretoria University also in South Africa, or CIDERS in Zambia. 
we work with companies, maybe some of them are familiar to you, like GitHub, Splunk, or DigitalOcean. Uh, we also work um, with IRB Barcelona, where I did my PhD, but also Pisa University, New York University in Langone, um, UCL London, and uh, University of Bristol. And um, importantly, we also have the support of collaborators like Medicines for Malaria Venture, the Swiss Tropical Health Institute, or Seattle Children's Hospital, which kindly provide um, their data so that we can build models and apply them to ongoing research projects in the global south. Um, currently, um, we've grown a team. We've directed up to three master theses. Um, we've had a lot of interns, mostly from underrepresented students in STEM. We've worked. We have. Um, we've worked with three data science uh, data scientists in house. We currently are three people full time on the team, and we have had the pleasure of working with more than twenty volunteers. With that overview, let's maybe jump into um, our. AI-based toolbox for drug discovery in um, antimicrobial drug discovery. The first thing that we do is we serve AI models. We provide models in a very easy to use manner for experimental scientists to incorporate them to their pipelines, what we call the Ercilia Model Hub. The second thing that we do is we've developed an automated tool to basically train and build these models in a way that they are very easy to maintain. So if there is new data coming in, they can easily be updated with new data. And finally, on what we are focusing on now, of course, as everyone is, um, is on expanding the chemical space uh, in the search for new antibiotics using uh, the new generative AI frameworks that have appeared. So let's start by the beginning. At the Ercilia Model Hub is our core platform. Everything is centralized there. And the idea is that we are able to provide to scientists models, machine learning models that, for example, predict a the binding uh, to a target or the activity against a specific pathogen or toxicity or uh, any kind of atme property without the scientists having to understand anything that happens inside here. So we take care of taking the data and processing it, training, testing and validating the model, hopefully if we can experimentally. And the scientist just needs to select the model of relevance, come with a question, and basically run the model and get an output. Of course, the models in the hub, they are not all ours. We are an open source organization. So we have first models that we simply collect from literature. This is an example from an excellent seminal work in um, antibiotic drug discovery using AI. And the authors of this paper describe a new framework um, for antibiotic um, activity prediction. And we've taken their um, their code and incorporated it in our hub, of course, citing the original source, source of the authors and maintaining the, the licenses and so on. The second thing that we do is we also uh, use um, in how we also develop in house models with public data. So we look at the literature for interesting data sets that have been released openly. In this case, I'm giving the example of a known anti malarial screening done in collaboration with pharma companies. So we've taken this data set. Um, and basically build a model so that when we input a drug, we also get a prediction of whether it will be an active or inactive anti-malaria according to this data set. And the most interesting is we train models in collaboration based on our partners' data at the uh, universities that we collaborate with. In this case, I'm giving an example of natural product antimicrobial activity, which is a project that we are working at the University of Wea. So we use their data to basically build new models and predict whether these uh, compounds are active or inactive. This is what uh, the model hub looks like today. We have around 150 models and it's constantly growing. So if there is ever a need, we are happy to try and incorporate a new model to make it more accessible. If it's sitting there on a code repository and it's very easy, it's very difficult to implement, we are happy to have a look and see if we can put it in our framework or if there is an interesting data set, um, if we can model it. And just to acknowledge that this has been built since to an, thanks to an open source community effort that has been developed in collaboration with GitHub Atlassian and outreach interns, as well as uh, Harvard University volunteers. So basically, every time we want a new model incorporated, we start a GitHub issue, so it's open, everyone can follow the discussion. Once there is certain um, discussion around this, finally the model, the model is approved by the team. The contributor uh, can start working on that, they fork the repository, They work on the model and finally they push back the code. There is a set of automated tests that happen and only at the last step, their CDA team intervenes again to do a review of the model incorporation and the model is finally released in the hub. 
um, so an example of where have, are we using this kind of tools is uh, this one. Um, today we'll talk a bit about mountains. This is Mount Cameroon uh, in Cameroon, of course. This is the University of Wea, the Center for Drug Discovery that has been built in the last two years. I've seen literally this building grow. This center is focused around the discovery of um, African natural products as a source for antiviral activity. Um, they have a database of over 10,000 natural products um, that they have collected over the years. And now they are looking into, um, into finding which ones of those would be active against HIV, COVID, and then also other disease indications like uh, malaria or TB. This is done in collaboration with the Worcester Institute in the US, which provides the experimental support uh, to develop this center. We provide the data science and computational support, and this is a project funded by the Gates Foundation. If you're interested in seeing what we envision for this center, we published this perspective uh, a couple of years ago when we started the project and on how we see this kind of um, hubs growing across uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, on to the next tool that we have, which is called Zyrocam to build basically an automated pipeline to build AI models. Why we do that? Um, because we want our models to be easily maintained by our partners uh, who may not be that uh, experts on artificial intelligence and machine learning so that they can simply run the models every time new data comes in. Um, so what do we mean by that? It's basically, and at its core, um, QSAR, quantitative structure activity relations. We have a set of molecules typically with their associated activity, for example, IC50 against a specific pathogen, E. coli. These molecules, of course, we need to convert them to vectors because um, the computer needs to understand um, these chemical structures. This step is called fiaturization. Um, this is something that we take a lot of effort into making sure that we capture different information about the molecules, 2D structure, 3D structure, bioactivity, and so on. So these molecules get converted into these arrays of vectors. And then the second part, of course, is fitting the model to these vectors. So being able to predict whether a new a molecule will be active or inactive according to its characteristics. In a, this very schematic representation, of course, when we come with a new molecule, we see that this vector is actually very similar to the first one. And if the, this molecule was an active, this model will probably predict that this molecule is also an active. That is basically the idea behind it. it. It is, of course, much more complex, but basically this is what is happening behind the scenes. So how we have done that in our automated pipeline? Well, from here, Cilia Model Hub, we have a bunch of chemical descriptors that we can choose so we can select different ones depending on the type of activity that we are trying to model. We have um, descriptors that relate to uh, physical chemistry and fingerprints uh, for chemical structures, also more advanced graph embeddings or language embeddings, um, and also bioactivity descriptors. So we select the ones that are relevant for the task we have at hand. Um, for example, for this particular molecule, um, of course, these molecules get standardized and so on. All the descriptors are normalized if needed. And through the Cilia Model Hub API, we collate all these vectors that get pulled into a final vector. And this then goes onto the actual fitting of the model, which is also done using several automated techniques as an ensemble. Uh, so we have, um, we use the traditional three base classifiers like EGBoost or random forests. We also use uh, transfer learning techniques, mostly um, from the Grover descriptors using um, Keras tuners. Uh, we also use um, dimensionality reduction techniques um, to capture the most important features of each of those descriptors. And then finally, we also try to use image-based um, descriptors um, with the, this very cool open source package that is called MoMA. So we do an ensemble of all these descriptors to get a final model. We also have the individual models, but the ensemble is consistently outperforming each one of the individual models. And to showcase where we have applied this and show an example, um, again, I said this would be about mountains. This is um, Table Mountain at uh, UCT, University of Cape Town in South Africa. We work here at the HD Center, which is basically in this building you see here in the back. It's a small drug discovery center focused on malaria and tuberculosis. They had over 10 years of data accumulated in their databases. And what we have done 
is we've come in, we've taken their data and built a what we call a virtual screen cascade. So basically reproducing the experiments they do in the laboratory um, with machine learning so that now they can use that to predict whether it's worth to synthesize certain molecules and test them or maybe it's better to go another direction. We've done this um, over two years. Um, we're using a combination of their proprietary in-house data as well as open data sets and all the models have been released openly for anyone to benefit from them. So the virtual screening cascade starts with around 13,000 molecules screened over 10 years on whole cell assays around MTB, uh, well, mycotin tuberculosis, falciparum for malaria. They also do cytotoxicity and then ser um, they also move on to um, ADME, um, so administration and metabolism assays. Of course, as the cascade goes on, less and less molecules are tested because those assays are more expensive. So we're really interested in optimizing molecules for this last step so that they don't fail at um, advanced stages of their discovery. So to show these results, this is the kind of plot that Zydacam, our automated pipeline produces. You see there is a lot of reports, looks very complex. It is not. Um, this is an example using a tuberculosis data set um, where we have a hidden part of the training data as a test set. And here I only want to focus on two things. The first one is that one. So um, we see how the model indeed is able to give higher values, higher scores to active molecules against MTB and gives low, consistently lower scores to inactive molecules against MTB, making it a good discriminator for um, basically prediction of tuberculosis activity. These are the different combinations of descriptors and machine learning frameworks that I was mentioning. Uh, so we have a combination of those that are pulled together to be get the best performance that we can here. Um, this is the whole cascade. As I said, we are um, we are modeling several assays. We are modeling um, activity against plasmodium and falciparum and mycobacterium tuberculosis. We are monitoring. Uh, we are predicting cytotoxicity in human cells, solubility, a range of um, clearance um, in the in human, mouse, and rat, permeability, and of course, cytochrome inhibition and cardiotoxicity. Um, this plot shows the areas under the curve values of the different models. So we see that we can be extremely happy because out of the box, automatically, most of our models perform exceptionally well. And those that perform worse is because they are built with external data, data external to H3D that is maybe a bit far from their chemical space and just by adding actually um, not shown here but by adding a bit of internal data we are also able to bring these performances up to 0 0.8 of areas under the curve and of course we can see how these models nicely discriminate between actives and inactives across the different kinds of assay that we have bioactivity clearance inhibition of cytochromes cardiotoxicity and so on so we are extremely happy with these results and we ask ourselves how useful it would be for scientists at H3D. So we tried to reproduce an uh, assay that they had done a couple of years ago, where basically they had an interesting initial hit, this molecule against plasmodium. And then they derived a whole chemical series, all these compounds up to 65 compounds that maintain the core structure, as you can see here, and then have different radicals. And they basically synthesized all of them and tested all of them. So we said, we asked ourselves, what if we, before doing an experiment, run these molecules through our predictors? So predictors of um, plasmodium inhibition, of solubility, of um, permeability. So we want molecules that basically kill the plasmodium, um, uh, the plasmodium falciparum organism that are soluble, that are permeable, that are not toxic, um, that are not cleared because we want them to stay in the body long enough to actually have an effect and that do not inhibit, inhibit cytochromes to avoid side effects, right? So just by screening these compounds, we can quickly select molecules that have good activities in the red ones, so killing of the plasmodium and so on, and hopefully lower activities on the blue ones, so being not cytotoxic and so on. If we compare this that we select from the list, with actual experimental values, we see how our, our models perform quite well. This molecule was predicted to be active, and indeed it was active against plasmodium, but it was also predicted to be toxic, and indeed it was toxic. So this allows us to discriminate beforehand whether a molecule will be toxic or not. 
On the other hand, for example, this molecule was predicted to be active and not very toxic, and indeed it was active and not very toxic, so that's a very good candidate. And so we can do these kind of experiments uh, to really accelerate the drug discovery process and avoid costly failures, particularly in these resource-constrained settings where maybe not so many molecules can be tested at the same time. So with that, I'll move on to our third project, which is around generative AI. This is a still work in progress. Um, we are currently developing that. You are uh, welcome to go and check um, the active uh, development of the code that is happening on GitHub, but just, and uh, this is not yet published, so we don't, uh, we haven't finished the project yet. But basically, um, where we are now, what most people want to do is not predicting whether a new molecule will be active or not, but actually having an activity, you know you want to kill a certain pathogen and you want to get which molecule will do that, right? So you want to start from the activity and get the molecule. That is easily said, but not so easily done. Um, so I'll showcase an example that we did for the Open Source Malaria Consortium, which is trying to find patent-free anti-malaria candidates. Um, it's an international consortium where um, basically scientists volunteer their time and resources so that collectively we can advance new, tar new drugs um, against plasmodium. So we are very happy because out of eight of the drugs that we experimentally tested, four of them had excellent in vitro activity. Um, I'm going to show you how we did that. So basically, um, we generated a lot of candidates using several generative AI techniques. And then we rank those candidates based on our machine learning models for prediction of anti-plasmodium anti activity, as well as other um, interesting um, measures such as solubility or um, toxicity. So these are the different candidates. We knew that we wanted to maintain this core structure here. And we can see here, um, as the colors progress, uh, it means that these molecules are predicted to be more and more active. So we basically um, selected those that seemed more active. We also provide, try to provide ways in for which scientists can easily interact with our results. So this is a team app where you can like scroll um, each of these dots is actually one molecule and the color is telling you whether it's predicted to be very active or not. Molecules, sorry, molecules oops, that are closer together in this map means that they are more similar to each other. So that's like a nice interactive way of navigating scientific results. Um, so this is what we got. So this is the positive control, the original hit that they have. These are derivatives that we proposed that were good candidates, and that's an extremely good hit rate because 50% hit rate on a in vitro screening against plasmodium is actually um, extremely high. And we have very, very good candidates, such as this one that has um, below um, 0 0.1 micromolar activity. So we are very excited um, with these results, and hopefully we can move them forward still following this open source ethos and and, and rules. Um, so just to finish up, uh, I want to also share with you other projects that we participate in as part of our nonprofit mission that are not directly related to these three platforms that I have showcased you, uh, serving models, building models, and using generative AI to expand the chemical space. Um, we are very interested in reducing inequalities in global health. And as we all know, one of the biggest problems is that um, there is very little to no data on clinical trials and so on that happen in non-white, non-Caucasian populations. And this can have consequences uh, down the line on how our drugs administered, what are the dosages of these drugs and so on. So we are working again together with H3D um, to understand how we could optimize malaria and TB treatments in Africa um, by predicting relevant African specific pharmacogenetic variants. For those of you that are not so familiar with the um, with this uh, field of research, uh, pharmacogenes are those genes involved in the metabolism of drugs. So if you have carry certain variants, it may be that you metabolize a drug very fast, then therefore losing its efficacy, or you can maybe be very slow in metabolizing this drug, which leads to accumulation and therefore toxicity. Because most of the clinical trials have been done in um, white populations, dosages are optimized for white um, 
pharmacogenetic variants, but we don't know um, the effect of many of these new pharmacogenetic variants that we are identifying with new studies on African genomes mostly. And Africa is the continent with the highest genetic diversity um, worldwide. So we coupled our prediction of African pharmacogenes with tra more traditional PBPK modeling tools. And we are um, now in the second year of this project with very exciting results that hopefully can come out um, soon. And this is a project initiated by uh, combine, uh, combined funding from GSK, Novartis, and the South African Medical Research Concer Council. It's called the Gradient Project, and it is supporting 10 projects across Sub-Saharan Africa. The other thing that we do is capacity building and training, as I mentioned at the beginning. We really want to support scientists uptake these new skills across the Global South. So we try to do in-person workshops on how to use data science and AI for infectious disease research. We try to do at least once a year um, in-person workshop, fully funded for participants and distribute that across different areas, geographies. So in 2022, we, in Southern Africa, well, actually in South Africa, we did a, um, a course funded by the Wellcome Trust. Last year, we did a course at our partner organization in Cameroon with the support of the Gates Foundation. And hopefully um, this year we can um, organize some more courses in West and East Africa as well. So the last thing that we do, um, we offer remote internships um, to computer scientists. We are really interested in bringing computer scientists and software engineers to the field of drug discovery, um, open source drug discovery. So leveraging the technical skills those people have and bringing them together with the biological and scientific skills um, that their Celia core team has to actually build very cool products that are, are really useful and are capable of advancing research in low resource settings. Um, mostly do that through the outreach internship program, which supports underrepresented minorities in STEM. It's rounds of 12 weeks internships. We just finished one and are starting the next one very soon. And we also provide um, mixed opportunities with interns from other um, universities like Stanford universities. And we are also trying to um, support international visitors to our new offices in Barcelona, Spain. Um, so that's it. Before finishing, I wanted to share with you all before I get the question about the name of Ercilia, where, the, where does it come from? Ercilia is the name of an invisible city described in this book called Invisible Cities by Italian writer Italo Calvino. And this uh, imagined city, its inhabitants throw threads every time they establish a new relation until the threads are so, so thick that one can no longer pass in the city. And then they leave the city, leaving only the network they have created and start anew somewhere else. So we see this as a metaphor of the networks that we are trying to build in global health and drug discovery research. Um, networks of people, of course, community. Um, finally, as a take home message, we are a nonprofit organization. We develop AI tools for drug discovery and global health. We combine remote work and on site implementation of partner organizations, spending one, two, three months at a time at our partner organizations to make sure they uptake these tools and are able to continue the work. We also offer capacity building activities. Everything we do is open source. We mostly focus in collaborating with institutes from the global south, but we are always open to hearing about good work and people that could collaborate with us. So, of course, we have not gotten here alone. There is, we have uh, to acknowledge our funders and also um, a lot of organizations that provide in-kind support um, that allows us um, to sustain all our infrastructure, um, generous donations, um, particularly from the Splunk Pledge and Fast Forward Initiative and HPE as well. And then, of course, our fantastic team of collaborators and contributors and our alumni, including many of our interns and master's students. So, and of course, thank you all um, for your attendance. Ooh, this is copied from uh, an old slide, sorry. There is no poster today. That's from another, um, that's from another conference. But thanks so much for your attention. Um, those of you that is very early morning, uh, I really appreciate you waking up to join us here today. And yeah, that's it. I guess I'm gonna stop presenting. 
Um, yep, Seth. All right. Th thank you very much. I'm not sure how to do claps here. Oh, that's the way. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Gemma, for, for your talk. Uh, very engaging <clears throat> and, uh, and interesting. And I guess... Uh, you know, well, people thinking, uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, While well, people are thinking of questions, I may ask one, or if somebody wants to, I guess you can put it in the chat. So in the meantime, I'll ask, I'll ask a question. So antibiotic resistance is something that's actually very close to my heart, and I have one student that's working on that. And, and one of the problems with antibiotic resistance is, and I'm talking about antibiotic resistance, not antimicrobial, antimalarial. That's a different thing. We're talking specifically about resistance to infectious diseases caused by bacteria is a universal problem and uh, not just affecting the global. Uh, oh, there's a Q&A in their questions. OK, there they are. All right. So, OK, so I'll, I'll leave my question to the side. Let's answer the, the guests first. So Xiang Ma is asking. What models did you use to generate molecules and how did you choose the best candidates? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, very good question. So that's why I said it's work in progress. For the data that I showed, we mostly used reInvent, um, which is actually, uh, I'm looking for the lean. Um, we mostly used reInvent and something called the virtual libraries, which um, work very well in in low data settings so i'm gonna this is rain the link to rain then um and now we are exploring others and um, for a couple of projects that we have ongoing and also for the second round of generation so i cannot share much on those we do not develop our own generative ai frameworks we use open source tools that are already out there um, and what we really focus on, as you say, is to choose the best candidates. So for that, we really use um, a bit of creativity and imagination. Um, and we combine filtering out for activity that we are interested in. If we know the target, we also use some docking experiments, if that's the case. And for which some projects, we do have the targets that we want. Um, and then we do work closely with chemists. So every time we come up with like a list that we think is feasible to examine, like less than a hundred compounds that we think are really good, then we go to the chemists that have more experience on that project and ask them to, to provide their feedback. So we, we do use a lot of human feedback as well to see if we are going in the right direction of not, or not. Okay, another question from Abdul Karim Lalouy. Uh, are using MLOps? Um, yes, yes, of course. So basically, um, the hub, the ERC model hub, which is our core structure where all the models end up going there, is an MLOps um, platform. Um, we are improving it every time. Basically, more most of what we do is around making it faster and easier to deploy models. And of course, we are Contents constantly working on our testing models to make sure that we can like provide more and more um, usability information um, to our users, and it's being incorporated into a resource called BioModels um, from the EMBL EBI. So, yes, um, we do use MLOps. Thank you. Are there any questions yeah. from the audience? Well, somebody to think of. Um, so I'll, I'll go back to my question, I guess. So antibiotic resistance as in, uh, resistance to, uh, you know, antibiotics that affect bacteria is, is a universal problem. It also kills, um, in, you know, um, both in, in, uh, uh, the global North and the global South. And the reason that I've always been given, uh, that, uh, pharma is not looking for more new antibiotics is the inability is, is the short shelf life and uh, very low return on investment that there are for for antibiotics and that you know would change only with some sort of you know government incentive to you know search because the free market doesn't support search for antibiotics a very short shelf life because 
and the, uh, because resistance develop very quickly, or um, um, you know, looking for alternative to antibiotics, right? Mm -hmm. So, what's what's your what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, well, first, I totally agree. Like, there is not enough incentive, maybe, for pharma companies compared to like developing a cancer drug or so on. There will be in the future, unfortunately, because it's going to be a huge problem or it's anticipated to become a huge problem, as you say, and also, unfortunately, but um, honestly as well, not only for the global south, but also for um, high income countries, which means probably pharma companies are more incentivized to put resources into that. Um, so I think that's one part that we'll see more and more interest on that area, research area um, because it's going to start affecting more and more and high-income countries um, and then I do believe in the as I said um, in the power of open source drug discovery meaning if there is enough collaboration and candidates are pushed for good candidates are pushed forward in a fully open manner so that um, they really they reduce the cost of bringing them to market um, we can start to see some of these novel like non-profit pharma models so hopefully those will also develop in the future um, and we can start uh, using those frameworks for neglected diseases. I do not think, so I think antibiotic resistance will become a big problem, but I don't think it will be as neglected as other diseases, like tropical diseases. But that's my Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, any thoughts about um, application of your work towards uh, vaccines? So mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. lots of uh, work is going on on vaccine generation using ML, and uh, there have been there has been talk, for example, of vaccines for malaria, although that hasn't mm -hmm. happened yet. Um, well, there is new vaccines uh, that just came out last year for malaria that are being tested in the field, which is super exciting. We don't work on vaccines basically because uh, we are now focused on drug discovery um, and our direction is more moving towards um, pharmacogenetics, metabolism of drugs and so on. Um, but I am very excited every time I hear news about vaccines because they could certainly reverse the trend um, for eradication of neglected tropical diseases. So hopefully the new mRNA vaccines that have been used for COVID can also be applied to to some of these infectious diseases, though that's not the direction that we are going to go in as our studio. Okay, and one last question, sorry, because this is really interesting to me. Um, so one thing, I'm in a, a College of Veterinary Medicine. There's a lot of talk here about what is known as the One Health approach, meaning, you know, your livestock should be healthy and your, you know, whatever mm -hmm. companion animals should be healthy so that you should be healthy. And, you know, and, and zoonotic transmission is something that happens a lot. So veterinary drugs would be as important, not only, you know, also because, you know, a lot of these animals, uh, people rely on for food and, and their, their, you know, their, their livelihood, but also because they transmit uh, or people transmit to them infectious diseases. So have you thought about expanding into veterinary um, drug design? Mm -hmm. that yeah, that's not. a good question. Um, I, I mean, we are a small team, so we try to focus our efforts. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't, but also because uh, most of our partners are working in human diseases. Mm -hmm. So we try to be very community oriented. If um, we start having more contact with uh, people doing this kind of research and we see there is a need and an interest in our tools in that area, yeah, we would be open to to working on that. But okay. we basically, yeah. Because we actually have teams of veterinarians do. working with uh, <laughs> Global South countries yeah. on things like that. So maybe there's something there. I can oh. try and shoot a few emails. All right. 